G'day guys and welcome to the Centre Bounce where today we'll be talking about the match sim that took place that took place between Melbourne and Richmond at Casey Fields. Stay tuned. Big J, I was at Casey Fields today and I watched Melbourne play Richmond in what mm -hmm. was a very nice day of football. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. And if uh, fans like got a bit of a keen eye and want to go back over the KO recordings, they can actually find you. What was it fifth quarter? I don't know how fifth yeah. quarter works, the way that they did the game set up for today, but I'm going to say fifth quarter just so it doesn't um, mess with my brain too much. But you were on TV. Yes, that's right. Uh, and if you can't be bothered going through there, just look up the video where Clayton and Oliver kicks his goal. And you're going to have to pay very close attention. And I'm sitting next to Swizz, our good friend Swizz from Supercoach Insider. Uh, we're sitting front on the, on the, on the boundary line, there, on top of a Chisholm sign. And mm -hmm. you won't see us very obviously because as soon as he kicked that goal, our heads went straight down into our phones trying to tweet about it as opposed to celebrate the goal. So shame on us. We, we tried to get the news out ASAP without truly in, <laughs> embracing the moment. But you can see us on that highlight video, um, as well as other highlights that we're going to be talking about today in relation to the game, because it was our first official hit out between two clubs that aren't from the same, you know, two teams that are not from the same club. So that was really exciting. Yeah, I definitely. I was telling people on Twitter, say, hey, jump on Joe's personal Twitter. He's got all the highlights and kind of as things were going on game by game or quarter by quarter, you know, stay tuned with those. So really big help for those people that maybe didn't have KO or couldn't get down to the game. It was free, but I wanted to just before we started with, you know, super coach relevant stuff, just tell us kind of how the game went, the flow of the game, what it was like being there live. Yeah, it was a really good game. Uh, it was very packed, actually. It was very surprising how many people um, came across to, to watch the game. It was it was a ripping atmosphere. And Melbourne really came out and were on fire. They, they certainly established um, some really important dominance very early on. They had a lot of amazing leadership, um, especially in the midfield, where mm -hmm. all of the damage was being done from. Um, you obviously had Maxi Gorn, who was doing incredibly well. There was no Nan Curvis today. So it was, you know, Nay Smith and um, and Ryan, Samson Ryan, who really had a, a massive task to do ahead of themselves against Max Gorn. And, and Petrarca was just unreal um, with his partner in crime, Viney, today. Clayton Oliver didn't come in until after the AFL listed players were done. So it was a very strong start by Melbourne, Petrarca, Gorn. The, the usual suspects uh, mm. who really kicked away early. But a credit to Richmond, they were also missing a lot of players from that midfield mix, and, and they did a really good job finding their way back into it. Yeah, I looked at that first quarter and was like, cool, Melbourne's up by, what, 30-odd points? They're happy, they're good, they can just coast this out for the rest of the game. No, after the first quarter finished, Richmond came out with like seven or eight goals. Of, like It was 10, no 10 goals, goals in a row. <laughs> Ten goals in a row. Well, there you go. So, yeah, Richmond kind of just turned on the Jets. From what they were saying on the TV, it seemed a little bit like Petrarca had been moved a bit more forward, which yep. kind of just left a lot of that capacity to to stop the Richmond engine from the midfield. Yeah, he, he was stood on. Um, we could see uh, mm. next to the – from where we were sitting, we could clearly see – what happened to Petrarca, got a cop to step, and then we could see him sort of limping a little bit. Um, the trainer went out to him uh, and we're like, yes, go out, take him off. What are you guys doing? Don't don't leave Petrarca out here in a practice game. Um, mm. the, the trainer came out to him and he just told him to piss off, essentially, and then waltzed his way to the forward line and sat himself forward. So maybe they wanted to take Petrarca off the field, but he was so adamant, nah, 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 I'm right, she'll be right. Um, and he kept himself in the game for almost the whole four quarters, which I was really surprised about. I thought they'd do something similar to like a Maxi Gorn, play for a half, and then, all right, mm. have a rest. No need to, to risk injury here in a match sim. But he was insanely good, Petrarca. I thought he was uh, I thought he was best on ground um, for, for Melbourne, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if it happens in the regular season, well, there comes DPP. So hopefully they can learn from these um, preseason games. We're like, the truck forward does well, kicks goals. Let's go. Yeah, hundred percent, exactly. Uh, and we get, and we've also the Herald Sun have also 
released some numbers mm -hmm. from that game just to kind of show um, not just in terms of the, the sender balances, but also in terms of the, the ruck splits. And um, Petrarca, you know, had 47% of the... That was his breakup in terms of yeah. his CBAs because, as we mentioned, he did go forward um, and rest and rest a bit more forward. So with this, that meant he played 53% um in the forward line in terms in the forward line which would yeah. have been enough for dpp yeah definitely and looking at the stats as well i, I was thinking of cozy picket it always seemed like in the first two quarters at least that he was around the ball in the midfield i feel like everyone's trying to do the papley cameron cozy picket style now where that small forward who can run and you know he's decent in the contested game actually offers something through there i'm not sure yeah. if it was because melbourne had a few players out that that's what it was but I know they've toyed a little bit with that in the past and, you know, as you say, worked out quite well for them today. It was okay. But the problem that I, that myself, that I noticed at the ground, um, as well as Dave, um, a friend of Swizz there, who is a Melbourne man, and what we both noticed was the ball was just bouncing out of the forward 50, out of mm -hmm. um, Melbourne's forward 50 way too easily. And it just so happened, you know, coincidentally, that it was a lot of the time when Pickett was in the midfield trying to mm -hmm. be that, energize a bunny around the ball but without him being in the forward line to apply that forward pressure there wasn't really anyone else with that speed that like like Pickett has in the forward line that just sort of try and lock it in or or crumb it at ground level so i'm not sure how often they're gonna persist with Pickett having a lot having bulk cbas i think they're gonna reduce it to being something minimal because i don't think it was overly successful um, for for a lot of the game, to be honest. Did, did you pick up on anything else? Because I know that like Max Gorn basically only played the first half, didn't play the second yep. half, as we say up there, um, 15 out of 18. He took some monster grabs in the forward line. Yeah, absolutely. And he kicked a couple of goals as well, um, which, which it just shows. Like Maxi Gorn, he, he was really into it. Um, mm. He gave away a free kick against Noah Bolter back in, in, in the, the Melbourne back line. Uh, and he was so pissed off about it. You could see him. Mm -hmm. He wanted to win. He wanted his plan to win. And he's he's taken it seriously. And he really should be a lock in everybody's side. He is going to be getting a lot of monster points. Um, at this 15 out of 18 suggests uh, is the number of center bounces that mm. took place in the first half. And he he had 15 out of 18 of them, which was obviously incredibly so incredible. So um you got to keep a close eye on Maxi Gorn. I think everyone should have them in should have him in their side at either R1 or R2 depending on what sort of ruck line you're looking for, but I think you need to have Max Gorn. His his output was was great and obviously we all know that he's also capable of going back behind the play and taking some intercept marks as well. So um Maxi could he, I reckon he's still got his hand up for best ruckman in the con, in the competition still. Yeah, and heading over to the Richmond side as well. Obviously They've had a few injuries, things like that. No Dustin Martin, no Taranto, and no Man Curvis, which is why you see them only basically playing two rucks. Um, yep. It felt like Naismith did very well, and as a super coacher who wants a playing R3, it's a bit sad he didn't come to like a North Melbourne or someone else that basically has a ruck spot free for him to play because he looked good. Um, In the past, obviously, injuries and stuff had hurt him, and that's why he got let go of Sydney, but he looked pretty good today, Joe. He did. He did look pretty good. Not not gonna lie, um, but talking about it from a, from a super coach perspective, you know, even even Swizz himself, the Mister Tiger Man, even he isn't really sold and isn't really confident about having a Nay Smith sitting at R three. He he really mm -hmm. would need Nan Curvis to to not be available to to start mm -hmm. the season for him to be to be a viable pick at R three. Otherwise, um, it might be better to be looking elsewhere. And I know some people have been talking bad about Samson Ryan. I, I don't know. I thought Samson Ryan did okay. He's up against like the best ruckman in the competition, Max Gorn. So you can, I think, I think you should be forgiven, um, especially in that first half for, for for getting beaten by a better opponent. It's just it is what it is. But uh, I thought he still did okay around the ground, took some marks, and was involved in the play. Um, definitely more interesting though uh, is is this guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I was thinking, I was just looking at the Super Coach ad on the right hand side. You know, we, we've kind of been blessed with having that while we're actually talking about Super Coach. Um, I wonder what the ownership of Thompson Dow will be pre game to post game today. 
Because uh, as we said at the start, right, Richmond had a few players in that midfield who were supposedly be going to be getting a lot more midfield time in Dusty in Taranto. But Thompson Dow, we'd heard some things in the preseason about, cool, this kid's on fire, doing very well. And, you know, as we were talking about off air, we use these preseason games as confirmation for players. Not necessarily, cool, this guy dominated in a preseason game. Now we must put him in our sides. Um, what did you think of Thompson Dow today? I thought it was great. I honestly thought he was his his attack on the football. It's it's very mm. it's very Melbourne. Yeah, you know, very not sorry, very very Richmond esque. You know the, the the Richmond dynasty of old, how they were just brutal, relentless. Content. Like that, he just fit that mold so well. His attack on the football mm. was awesome. Quite a few times, we could hear the collision of the bodies um, yeah. at the game, and we're like wincing on the sidelines, like how hard they were hitting into each other. Um, I know it was a practice game, but they were trying to win. <laughs> don't don't you worry about that. They they certainly, mm-hmm. they certainly didn't take a backward step in this game. And I loved his um his contested ball winning. And I mentioned this in um, another video that I did with Swizz on Supercoach Insider. I just think that with a full complement in the midfield, like a Dusty, a Taranto, you know, a Baker perhaps in there. Mm-hmm receiving some of these handball outlet passes that he was doing because it was a few times where he was first to the football, put his body on the line, and then did this little handball out into space, hoping for a teammate to get onto it. Um, mm-hmm. Today, he just didn't have the full the full list, I suppose, the full midfield, uh, and wasn't at its full strength. And then obviously against the likes of Petrarca and Viney, who were contested mm-hmm. balls, a few of those handballs didn't actually quite, you know, hit the target. So he's he's... But the optimism there is definitely there. The upside is definitely there. Whether he gets continued CBAs like this much CBAs that we see here today with these guys coming back into the side, because we know Presti is on the ball. Baker's been training on the ball a lot more. Taranto obviously is on the ball. Dusty could play on the ball. The question becomes, does he maintain this level of CBAs? And to be honest, I don't think he has to. Um, mm. even if he got three, even if he has three quarters of what he had today or a half, I still think that he'll be able to make the most of it given just how good he was today, just to the eye and the way he's winning the, the, the hard ball. That even if he had half or three quarters of what he had today, he'd still make enough money, he'd still score well enough to make you decent coin at 200 or thousand dollars. So, I was a really big fan, um, of Dow to be honest. I can't wait to see how he goes against the pies. I guess that's where it's nice that we've got, you know, one more actual preseason game next where, you know, live telecast, that kind of thing, all the stats will be recorded because it's won by the AFL versus this one. That was more the clubs. Um, and then round zero to kind of gauge that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have also sort of the way we've sort of set it up now, talking about the teams in a more mm-hmm. specific i suppose manner um because we have got each of these players now that we sort of wanted to quickly have a little touch on on an individual yeah. basis um we'll start with richmond and then we'll move on talking about melbourne as a team mm-hmm. um and i wanted to start with i think the the most prominent defender coming out of richmond and that is Jaden short who really I mean, well and truly had that goal. halfback role yeah Pick the goal <laughs> classic time. He did. How, how, he does did. That, how does that work out? Um, yeah, fantastic player. It's someone that we had been talking about in the preseason games and whatnot as well, just being like new coach. Does Jaden Short go back to that type of role that he had a couple of years ago? Um, he looked so good during the preseason game today. Obviously, smaller ground, whatever. There's things to take into account, but it's just a shame that we're so, we've got so many good super coach options around the price and Richmond have an early buy. A lot of people yeah. might have him you know, in their sides otherwise. Yeah, I think a lot of people do have him in their sides with the hope of flipping him to a Nick Dacos. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think everyone knows what our sort of position is when it comes to the flipping of the premiums. But Mm -hmm. Jaden Short, um, he was a bit of a butcher early on, to be honest. He couldn't hit a target to save his life. But other than that, he really well and truly worked into the game. Um, We do have Noah Bolter here as second one because he is a, a defender. But he played pure forward this this after this morning. So good in the air, like dominant. That first quarter was just taking. Like you could see a lot of the questions going into the preseason, especially from Swizz and, and Ward Swizz being our Richmond, you know, Richmond correspondent. I'll call him. Um, was more just what do they do with Lynch kind of being in and out of the side and no more um, rewalt? 
So, yeah, definitely Noel Bolter and um, someone else we'll talk about soon kind of dominating up in the forward line. It, yep. it looked good. It looked scary. Like, I know North Melbourne with no key defenders, they're just going to get dominated. And I think Stephen Mays and, and other players, they can't stop him. No. Bolter and Kaczynski had a really good pairing, um, I thought. And I was and I turned to Swizz. I'm like, maybe you don't need Lynch after all. <laughs> this is, a, yeah. this is a, a, a very formidable duo. So I think after the first quarter, his, his impact certainly diminished. Uh, I'll say first half. Um, Bolter's impact certainly did it. He, he was he was on fire. Um, mm-hmm. these guys are more, these guys were more of your traditional defenders. Uh, Sam Banks, I know Swiss definitely liked what he saw every now and then. Um, with some of the things that he did, they did really well. Richmond, I think, all in all, in the way that they played the game, they did mm-hmm. well to capitalize on Melbourne's shit entries, um, yep. which were which still plagues them even, even today. And they did a really good job switching it up and attacking the, the, the fat side of the ground. They went wide to the open space and Banks um, did that really well, as did Tom Brown. I think they're both really, I think that seemed to be their instruction was to don't just stick down the line. If the opportunity is there to switch it, go for it. And yeah. I think both of these guys, Banks and Brown, did a very decent job um, doing that off half back to open up and start a lot of the scoring chains for Richmond. Yeah, I, I was just impressed by the, the pace that they had coming. You know, Melbourne would try and kick it into the forward line that either get a mark or miss or, you know, just get stopped in that defense. And then Richmond just be able to use the corridors and throw the ball down there and be like 10, 20 seconds and they'd be lining up for another goal. So, yeah, it's I'm thinking 2019 Richmond where they were just pacey and they can do whatever they want. I don't think, you know, preseason hype and whatnot, but I don't know if they're going to be bottom four like some people have them in their um, rankings, Joe. Exactly. Definitely came as a, as a surprise to many people. Um, but this guy wasn't a surprise. Josh Kipkis, mm. um, he was very good. Yeah. You know, I, I found in some of the one-on-ones, he was quite good. And then using, you know, being used in transition kind of from, he didn't take the kick out but he was the one that the kick out went to and then kind of distributing off the ball there. He might not score us huge Supercoats points, but no. it looks like he's locking himself in a position in the team and that's what we want. That's what we were trying to confirm over the preseason. So, yep. I mean, all, all the better for us. Yeah, he will definitely play. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think he's fine for a D6. I, don't, I think mm. it's okay. Um, obviously, it would be probably most ideal if he was a D7, for example, because... Yep. Just due to the, to the role that he plays, if you know there will be some games where he has to play really accountable um, and really just be very spoil heavy as opposed to taking marks, and then there'll be some days where he takes a lot of intercept marks. So it's just got to ride the highs and the lows with Gipkis. And if you can get him at a D at a D seven, will be ideal. But if you have to have him at D six, then then so be it. I don't think it's the end of the world. Mm. Um, moving to the midfield. I thought Jacob Hopper. Now I know we we spoke off air, and you said you said that this name didn't really pop up much when it comes yeah. to the telecast. But looking yeah, at I, the ground, Swizz and I turned to each other and said, "Wow, this guy's been on fire today." Yeah, it, it felt like always on the TV coverage or on KO coverage. Obviously, they um, were talking up Dow a lot more and what he was doing versus Hopper, and maybe they were just getting confused and thinking, "Hey, look, Dow is actually Hopper." But I remember kind of. People have talked about, cool, first preseason actually happening, Jacob Hopper doing quite well and whatnot. Um, he had a similar thing, I think, last year when he came over from GWS, just how good he was in those preseason games, which led a lot of people to pick him a bit, you know, being a bit cheaper in Supercoach. So, yeah, definitely one to watch over the next couple of games, but going to be hard, Joe, because we've got Crouch, we've got Martin, some people are picking Guthrie, and then some people are picking Ollie Wines. Like, Feels like Jacob Hopper, if he was to come into that mix, would be on the bottom. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I, and I think he's got an early I, buy. and that that early buy is probably what puts him lower. I think mm. um, Thompson Down. We've already spoken about. He's done really well. McAuliffe, um, he's here because not because it's a positive. I'm here to, to talk about him because I know he's he suddenly burst onto the radar a little bit in 
the last month or so because of the reports mm-hmm. coming out of Richmond and how well he had done in the match sim. He really didn't show much today, unfortunately. He he only had like two center bounce attendances, which is obviously not anywhere, not anywhere near as much as what we hoped he would have, especially considering what sort of expectations we had built up for him as a result of the news and the, mm-hmm. what the what the track watchers were saying. Um, and with a su- substantially weakened Richmond midfield, like it was today, for him to only get like two center bounce attendances was certainly a little bit of a letdown. Would have loved to have seen a bit more out of him. So, look, I'm, I'm not completely putting an a, a, a cross through his name, but um, just don't don't get your hopes up too much on on, on McAuliffe. I know we, we lost Clay Hall um, in the last couple of days to an injury, and now McAuliffe's gone down. So these 117k rookies. Sean Manor um, appeared to not be 100% fit in one, one of those previous match sims as well. So the 117K rookies in the midfield appeared to be dropping left, right, and center. But keep mm. a close eye on Kane and see how he goes against Collingwood. Yeah, I don't even think it was a from, from what I saw from the TV, like, oh, he was playing and then just got limited CBAs. He actually came on towards the end in the fourth quarter as well. So maybe they're managing something with him or something happened, but... Heading into the preseason and, and, you know, us actually picking our team in three or four weeks is probably not the best signs for him. So, yeah, I, I've just moved him out of my team, Joe. Um, I'll have to find someone around a similar price, maybe over the next preseason games that we can actually chuck in there. because it, it, It's tough to beat at that price. It is. It is very tough. Uh, Samson Ryan and Naismith we spoke about already. Uh, Shy Bolton, man, mm-hmm. he, he was lighting it up today. Yeah, it just... I think from the get-go, maybe not in the first quarter as much, but we spoke about just Petrarca and his dominance in that team, how good he was. Um, Shy Bolton was in the middle, in the forward line, being used as that real traditional run-through player that was kicking goals that he kind of basically made his name off last year and the year before. So, yeah, it, it very, very, very good player. And I'm sad that no one else apart from Richmond, like Richmond were able to keep him because a couple of years ago it was Shy Bolton on the fringes he probably could have offered a first round pick and then got him into your team, but yeah, fantastic player. And you can see the future. Guy Bolton is that for Richmond. Yeah, absolutely. He's a gun. Uh, and this guy, Tyler Sonzi, every time he got near it, I would turn around and squeeze and be like, Oh mate, thank God this guy's suspended. <laughs> <laughs> like, because he is such a perfect downgrade target in around about round seven or so. Uh, will be a yeah. perfect time to downgrade this guy. And that's just the week I'm hoping to get Zach Merritt in the side as well. So hopefully, hopefully a Sonzi comes in and a Merritt comes in for me in round seven would be would be amazing if that's the case. He was really solid, Tyler Sonzi. He was very, very good. Um, tough over the footy, good presenter, took a few marks, great decision making. Oh, I, I love what I saw from Tyler. Yeah, just a heads up for all the people who might not know. I believe he got um suspended in the VFL last year and got, you know, I think it was like a six-game suspension or something. So, yeah, first couple of games off and then Richmond have the bye. So, as Joe says, around seven or eight is when he'll start to have his price increase. Um, I love the young talent coming through. We know about a North Melbourne and probably a Bombers and a few of these other sides. Richmond seems that their drafting just never goes astray, Joe. I don't think there's very many bad players. Um, coming out of this Richmond side, or at least players that we don't see often on, on TV versus other clubs. So, yeah, Sonzi's going to look great for them. Um, yeah. I don't know much about Campbell, so maybe I'll jump in on the Steely Green and you do Campbell. Sure. You're going to oh, jump okay. in on Steely Green? Okay. All right. No, no, we can do that if we want to do it that way. I thought <laughs> you were going to jump in on him. Um, Steely Green was used as that high half forward today. Kind of... M- not directly in the middle from what I was seeing, but as a link-up player, kind of high half forward on the wings. So fantastic player, really pacey, and was definitely putting in second and third efforts. Or if not like a tackle and then a handball kind of thing, he'd run from probably the wing up to the half forward line and be used in that transition maybe two or three times and then would kick into a, a, a Kazitsky or a Bolter and then they'd end up scoring the goal. So might be a little bit of a sneaky like sneaky pick for some of us, but think like how good a Judson Clark and a few of these other guys at Richmond were a couple of years ago. And for us in super coach, I hope he doesn't get picked early. I hope he can kind of be a fellow's craft for a bit. And like Somzi, be able to grab him later on in the year because he'd be able to make you some money. It's just hard when like we've got two or three or four, you know, rookie spots and you, 
you know, Sexton and, and Wilson and people we're going to talk about later in our forward lines um, are all taking up those at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Seth Campbell, he had a couple of really amazing moments during the game. There was one particular, um, just outside the forward 50, he's, 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 he's run out of forward 50, he's taken a dive um, with this half volley and then rides a bump with a lot of heat on him from opposition midfielder, and he just mm. flicks a handball out. Uh, it it was it was amazing to see um, to number forty one. I don't remember who number forty one is for Richmond on top of my head, but that was a really impressive, um, which led to a goal. So that was all on Seth Campbell. I turned around I'm like, who the hell was that? That was unreal. And it was like, oh, that was Campbell. I'm like, oh mm. yeah, mate, I love it. This, this he had some great moments. Um, I did like what I see from him yeah. and. Whether or not he makes a site, makes it onto the bench for me in the forward line remains to be seen. Obviously, we've got Darcy Wilson there. Um, and Windsor and maybe, Sexton, Tadman and a yeah. few of these other people at the moment. Yeah. Whether he gets ahead of them is a different story, especially with the early buyers. So I don't know. But yeah, I liked what I liked Seth Campbell's game today. He did he did very, very well. I think he I think he's gonna pass under the radar for a bunch of people, but here at the center bounce, we're giving him his due credit, I think. Well, that's what we're here for. Indeed. And now we will make our way over to Melbourne. And here we are now with the Melbourne players that we wanted to talk about today. And you'd, you'd be surprised that we're going to talk about Trent Rivers first and foremost today. Yeah, it was interesting because I know we said in our Richmond part of today's video that cool, we use the preseason games as confirmation of what we've heard in the in the preseason Um where people are playing and whatnot. Trent Rivers was penciled for midfield. We saw today, Joe, he played half back or played in the defense and then some midfield, right? Correct. And a lot of people throughout the preseason have been asking us about Trent Rivers. And every time Trent Rivers' name has popped up, I've always said, I, I would be on him more if not mm. for the competition that he's having with Sparrow. He and Rivers and Sparrow, I think, are the two that, sort of a bit of a Mr. Fix-It, can play behind the ball and then play on the ball. But I keep thinking every time Rivers wants to play in the midfield, I keep thinking of Sparrow. And then I saw it again today when we look at the center balances. Sparrow had 25 of them and Rivers did not feature at all. And Sparrow did mm. some incredible things um, in the midfield. We're operating out of a phone box, really tight, but he'd find a way out was really impressive and Rivers just continued to play off, you know, behind the football coming off half back to the stoppage. So for me, I don't think Trent Rivers, I think Trent Rivers, I've, I've never considered him a pick, but after I saw him today, I'm almost certain that he's not a pick. Yeah. It's just a bit of a shame, obviously Rivers being that so pricey and whatnot and Melbourne not really having any super coach relevant defenders, at least at that kind of premium level status. There was opportunity there for him, but, just looks like both of them have kind of cancelled each other out. Um, Mick V, Joe, did some good things today. Kind of the super coach submarine, I'll call him, from last year where no one had picked this guy in their team and every week he was just plodding along, making cash, whatever. Him in the back line, I'll tell you what, not a bad player. No, not at all. It was very surprising, actually, how he just continued to be used as an outlet pass out of half back. I honestly thought he was their best. Um, distributor of halfback for the day, to be honest. I thought McVeigh definitely was. If it wasn't for him or um, or sometimes a young man that we're going to talk about in the forward line a bit later down the track, I thought this guy was by far their, their best distributor of halfback. So that was really uh, surprising to me. And I know sitting with Swizz, would be like, What's McPhee priced at? And the oh, 321k. That is just that is just disgusting. Like that is yeah. filthy, that price point. So not a relevant super coach selection, but uh he he was their best off half back today. Um talking about best and kind of being disappointed, Marty Hoare, bit of a segue there, Joe. I know I jumped in on your on your books, but Marty yes. Hoare, I know a lot of us have got him penciled into our defenses, but unfortunately. The um, SSP signing player, Marty Hall, former D, came back to the Demons, was taking kickouts, but in the B team. So at the moment, he's a, hey, definitely not in my side anymore type player. But at that price, there's always a slot open for him. I'm really hoping that Simon Goodwin, look, I'm putting a lot of hope in Simon Goodwin here. I just think he's a mm. very incompetent coach. But I'm just hoping that he can see that 
they were struggling with moving the ball up half back. Um, and I'm hoping that they would they'd give Marty Hall more of a shot in their in their official preseason game hit out. So fingers crossed on that because if he's taking kick-ins in the VFL, hopefully in the VFL side, hopefully the next step up after seeing some adjustments that need to be made, that he gets a call up to the to the senior list. But mm-hmm. only time will tell. Um, as will time only tell with this superstar player and Oliver. I literally mm-hmm. stayed back. To the, in um, at the game just just so that I can see this guy in action, and yeah, he is he is not going to play AFL early on in the season, um, but he, he did look pretty good when you compare him to other VFL players as well. So obviously it's it's disrespectful to compare Claire and Oliver to some VFL players. He was clearly you know a, a different a different level to those guys, but uh, I honestly don't think he's gonna he's not he's not gonna I think be a threat to this man um, very early on in the season. Mm. It was definitely a confirmation for a lot of people in Supercoach, well, at least in the Supercoach kind of world, where Clary was stuck in the VFL team, had some good signs, wasn't the best thing ever, to now come in and be like, cool, well, we can start Petrarca. Lock Petrarca in. He looks so good in the A's, and then Clary looking not so great in the B's that that thing of, cool, when Petrarca plays, Clary doesn't, Clary, uh, Petrarca goes well. We saw a lot of that today. So, yeah, they kind of go hand in hand. But just nice to see Oliver out on the field. Obviously, it's oh, not yeah. been publicised kind of what has happened to him in the preseason. Everyone knows he spent some time away. But good to see him actually out there playing footy. And he kicked a nice goal from the um, from the forward pocket as well. That was a bizarre goal because... He like he was there on the field, but like mm. I don't know, it looked like he wasn't focusing right, and he's sort of backing up, looking at the ball, and sort of didn't realize that he was literally blocking the ruckman from running for the ruck contest. And I mm. remember us sitting there on the boundary line, we started laughing, I'm like, oh my god, he blocked, he blocked the ruckman, and it will just play on. Gathers the gathers the crumb and take and snaps a magnificent left foot snap from the from the boundary. It was crazy. It was such a bizarre passage of play. But um, he'd, all his teammates got around him and the fans, everyone applauded for him. It, it definitely was the feel-good story of the day, Clayton Oliver's um, return. That, that was a great yeah. moment for him. We'll have um, to um, ask Jaden. We'll have to ask Jaden P what a block on your own Ruckman counts as in <laughs> Supercoach scoring. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'd love to say I'd love, I'd love to ask Jaden Poposki what this guy scored today because mm. he was he was magnificent for Trika. He really he was taking the P one double five at times. He was just so dominant. But um, geez, he he's I can totally see people starting this guy even with the early buy, even with Max Gorn in the ruck. I I can see him being M two for the year. Uh... Mm-hmm. There you go. If yeah, not M one. Uh, I got to try and figure out my team, Joe. I chuck him in there, not chuck him in there. It's um, it's a real tough one. Um, Jack Vine is one who just kind of was doing a lot of things in the midfield today. Probably not as super coach relevant, but you know what you're going to get out of this player. You know he's the workhorse in the middle, kind of distributor, um, through handballs and whatnot. But anything you kind of saw from Viney today? I saw a lot of the same, uh, from Jack Viney. Classic Jack Viney. Mm. Which is a good thing. It's a very good thing from a football perspective, but um, don't don't expect more as a super coach selection. It's it's roughly m- much the same, to be honest. Um, if you're a Melbourne supporter, then you should be happy that you've still got Jack Viney at his finest, even in the preseason. So that's um, that's really good. Yeah, um, we've spoke about Sparrow a little bit already, so maybe head off yeah. to Max. Joe, Max Corn. Yeah. He only played one half the game. I'm not sure if it was a load management thing or was just like, cool, it's only the preseason. It's not worth points. Let's throw our VFL Ruckman or our kind of backup Ruckman in there, see what he can do, because we'll speak about Vernal. But Max Gorm was was doing his intercepts, kicking goals, just being super dominant today. Get him in your team, guys. Just <laughs> just, just, just don't, don't fade him. If you fade yeah. him, it's at your peril. Just believe me this. Believe me this. You don't want this. Yeah. Um, he went off the ground at half time, did a couple of laps at good pace, and it started to high five some fans. And we turned to each other and we knew that Gorn's not playing for the rest of the game. It really hmm. came to Will Verrill. If we look at the, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correctly, but Verrill seemed to take 
a lot of the ruck contests. Uh, out of the 16 in the second half, 13 of them was from Verrill. And I don't think he gave a good showing against Naismith and Ryan. Well, I mean, like, basically what? Young kid versus two two players who have at least played. Um, Correct. It's a bit tough, but I know Fullerton's out with injury at the moment. Maybe they're trying to try Beryl as like a, a ruck relief or just get him some extra game time, as we were talking about at the start of the episode. So, yeah, nice to see Melbourne playing someone else for a change, especially no more Darcy, no more Grundy. Like, you get to see who's kind of coming in. No more Jackson, you mean? No, sorry, no more Jackson. That's what I mean. Yeah. Jackson's going to join Sean Darcy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we move to the forward line. This guy was... We're a bit uh, divided on Jack Billings. A bit divided, yes. A, Whether he was divided. good or not. The people who watched mm. on TV said he was good. Myself and yeah. Swizz at the game did not think so. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, we know what role he was penciled in for because... Harms has basically left and he's kind of taken what would have been Harms' role a little bit, being that high half forward distributor, kind of the link up player when the ball's going to the forward line. Um, Billings, yes, no clearances, I know, but did do some nice setup type things. He had the old kick that maybe went too high and didn't go like bullet pass straight to another player. But I mean, it's Billings' first hit out in this um, Melbourne forward line. So he can be kind of um, excused. Uh, it's interesting, though, Joe, as you say, off the ground, what at the ground did you not think? Like, he didn't get as many touches as you thought or, like, what kind of gives you this opinion? I sort of mentioned this before as well, but when you go to a game, it's very different than what you see on the TV because mm. the TV is there to follow the ball and obviously give you a good view of what's happening around the football and, and you're tracking it. You don't really see the off-field, the, the 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 outside running of patterns and setups and things like that. You just suddenly you're just following the ball, and all of a sudden a kick, a long kick will happen, and you'll be like, "Oh wow, look at all this space!" But when you're at the game, you can see all of that unfolding before. And Jack Billings, to my eyes and to Swizz's eyes, who were both were both sitting there side by side watching this game. We thought his running pattern wasn't great. We thought that there were quite a few times where he'd find himself in a bit of no man's land, standing in between in, in an area where he can't receive the football from a kick from a from a from a teammate. Um and that he would have to resort to working really high up the ground to try and present as an option coming out of defense. Uh, yep. So the times where he was used in that capacity, it, it looked all right because yet he would find the short target, he would hit them up more often than not. But he was alternating between half forward and wing, and to me, I didn't. And obviously, only, only the two center bounces, so very minimal. And we all know how inconsistent the scoring on a wing can be. That's why we don't really prefer wingers. But considering that his ability to work high up the ground allowed, and allowed him to. To get a few possessions that way, maybe he could be war- he could be worth worth the pick um, at two hundred and forty three thousand. But I, I definitely thought the next kid that we're about to talk about certainly was more eye catching and more impactful than than Billings. Yeah, speaking of Caleb Windsor, who will start off now, my um my heart went in my my chest and was just like I think he took a bit of a hit in the ribs in the second quarter, I think it was, yeah, where he went bump. down and was ro- rolling around on the floor. And I was just like, oh, no, they've done it again and he's got a major injury. But this kid was everywhere, really showed. And I think Richmond were a team where they weren't, like, holding back as much with him. You know, they went in and gave him some tackles. And I know um, maybe Vlosten kind of gave away a couple of free kicks where he was pushing him around a bit. Like, hey, kid, welcome to the AFL. Um, Caleb Windsor stood up today, Joe. Yeah, he did. I, I love what I saw from him. He was that run. He can take multiple efforts up and down the wing. Um, he, he was great. And they didn't mind putting the ball mm. in his hands because they know that he's a go-getter. Um, he'll kick the ball a bit high up the ground, exactly the type of footage that we saw about a month ago from the, from the yeah. Melbourne socials and why we were raving about him. It's that kick into the middle of the ground, he would run after it, present as an option, receive the handball, take a tackler on using that that burst of speed and then kick the ball inside 50. This guy set up a lot of plays for him. Yes, 
some kicks were clangers and didn't go in the direction that he went. But that's because he was going for it. He's, he was going at full tilt. Uh, I loved a lot of his defensive efforts. He was definitely a lot more eye-catching to me than a Billings. Mm. Um, even though he didn't have a lot of rotations, he, he was playing pure wing. This is Caleb Wingser today. He was, uh, and where we were sitting, it was the Caleb Wingser wing. So uh, that's, mm. that's what I'm going to call it from now on because I, I love this kid. I think he's worth it. And he definitely provides a point of difference. Melbourne should be playing this kid round zero. I think they'll play him every week unless he's injured, to be honest. Um, Agreed. Bailey, Bailey Laurie is one that was, you know, we, we've seen what he can do in previous years, but he kind of stood up a little bit today, Joe. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. Yeah, I think he, he um, was playing a bit off halfback from what I remember and used as that link-up player, maybe not second or third in the um, – in the transition, but definitely was being mm. used there. Um, not a forward, as Supercoach would like us to believe. Yeah, yeah, no, he was good. He he was he was definitely good. I think I would have loved it if he got his hands on the footy a little bit more, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But um, for one hundred and twenty-five k sitting on the bench, uh, I'm not I'm not averse to the pick, especially when he was around the stoppage a few times. There was a few times where he would be sitting on the back the back end of the stoppage waiting for. To be a, an outlet user, um, yes. if, if someone's like a Viney or a Petrarca wins a hard ball and then just flick a handball out to him, he was going to be that that next guy, the the first guy in the chain, out of the stoppage. So it didn't it didn't come off quite well uh, a lot of the times today. But I can see that there will be some games where Melbourne is up and about and Melbourne's you know really dominant and feeding the ball out to him. I can see him having some spike games. So he he. Could have done better, but it also could have been worse, if, if you know what I mean. Um, you, so obviously today he played in the in the eighteen. Do you think maybe yes. they're setting up to keep him in the eighteen long term? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. He looked like he's he's got a filled out body, so mm. he he looks like his his body's really up to the rigors of an AFL season, and mm. he, he seemed like he can bump and things. So I think. I wouldn't be surprised if just by virtue of him sort of presenting well every in training every week that he gets selected. So, yeah, I, I think he's more likely to stay in the A-team than not, personally. But obviously, I'm not a Melbourne man. Any Melbourne supporter out there that thinks otherwise, please let me know. But just as an outsider perspective, it looks like he'll play. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know Melbourne have had some trouble with people called Brown. Ben Brown's injured. Mitch Brown kind of didn't do much, but Kynan and Brown, Joe, tell us all about him, why he's kind of burst onto the scene and why he was so impressive today. I love this kid because he, similar to a Windsor, bro, they have gusto. They yep. have it. They have that X factor that attack the game. You know what I mean? Um, they just don't have enough of that at Melbourne, I don't think. And when he was on the ball, it was very, it was a breath of fresh air. And I will not forget one, he set up a couple of really good goals, one to Petrarca and one to Van Ruyen, because, because he's quick on his feet, he'll take the game on, he'll take the tackler on, he'll take his direct opponent, and he will change up the angles. It's not just a straight linear um, attack on the football. He will cut inside on your defender, turn them inside out. Uh, and I, there was one, passage of play right in front of me. I won't forget. He stepped inside on two Richmond players to then set up to Van Ruin. Beautiful setup kick to Van Ruin on the lead who converted mm. accordingly. So I, I like this kid. I really do. I think he point he presents a point of difference to Melbourne. Uh, and, oh, mate, he's a mid-forward 102K. I pray that Simon Goodwin has two eyes that work really well. Hopefully you guys can't hear those motorbikes driving past my house. No, we heard that loud and clear. I thought you were fighting um, at first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kynan Brown, so pick 22 in the rookie draft. Basically one of the last picks in the rookie draft did come through as a father-son. So could have been like the submarine smoky of the draft. This kid, yeah. Melbourne had been one of those teams, Joe, pick up the good players late. They've definitely done this now. And as you say, looks very, very good in the first couple of rounds. I'm expecting, I think it, before today's video, I saw him at like 6% ownership. If he has a good preseason game next week, he could be a lot better. And DPP at 102K, get in my team. 
Yeah, 100%. Robertson was calling him the son of a gun over the loudspeaker all day. So he is the son of a gun, and hopefully he is a gun for us. That wraps up our discussion of the match sim between Melbourne and Richmond at Casey Fields. Yeah. If you like what you see, smash that sub button. We're growing the channel. We're having lots of fun. And if you haven't already, jump in the description below. You'll see a video on our Super Coach League. We've got three amazing prizes that you guys can win you know, over the regular season towards the end. We've got a jersey. We've got some tickets to an AFL game. And then an AFL voucher as well. It's completely free. Exactly. And if there's not too many contestants, that increases your chance of winning. So if you want to have a chance of winning, got to get in there and sign up and follow the rules and the steps that you need to do in order to get it. If you like what you saw here today, please drop us a like and hit that notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of the videos that we are putting out because we are pumping them out like hotcakes. Every content creator that I've spoken to always say, wow, you guys are killing it this preseason. And that's because we are putting in the hard yards, guys. Yeah. We're going to go through all the preseason games, so the one for the Community Cup, and then next week we're actually going to go through the real preseason games as well with all the stats, everything. So stay tuned for that content. We'll have a lot of things coming out over the preseason, and our Monday night live streams have been a bit of a hit, Joe. 100%. Those Monday night live streams continue to be a thing, and it will be a thing again on Monday. So please, we look forward to seeing you there all of your questions, all of your, you know, the banter and the fun. It's been amazing. Uh, football is right around the corner. We can talk more about these games and you can ask us even to review some, some of your teams as well. So make sure you head on over and join us on Monday night at 7.30 as we do every single week. Remember, guys, here at the Centre Bounce, we do the hard work so you don't have to. Bye for now.